Is that normal? Okay. Sorry. This is my first time learning how to live stream. Okay. Okay. I think you have to hit the gut it in order to get rid of that. Yeah. Okay. We're we're back. We're live in action. Um, so welcome everyone. We didn't really have like a, a leader of this, so we do have Corey here if you want to facilitate the meeting, or I'm happy to lead the agenda. Um, we didn't really like touch base before this one. So I think you do a great job facilitating. So okay, great. Well, so we're gonna start off with introductions. And while we do introductions, since kind of the whole meeting could is kind of around the same topic. Um and you know, could warrant the need for discussion about potential conflicts of interest. Just as you introduce yourself, please declare any um, potential conflicts of interest that you may have related to this discussion on kind of development partnership programs and public-private partnerships. Hi, Cindy. Um, so I'll go, maybe Kathy can start. Oh, uh, Kathy Austin. I'm a member of both the Central Area Advisory Board. That's all on. And um, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. So I'm kind of representing both today, and I don't have any conflicts of interest. So. And I'm Corey Harlan. I'm the Cities and Towns Program Manager with Central Oregon Land Watch and the Vice Chair of the Core Area Advisory Board. No conflicts of interest to declare. My name's Elisa Heim, and I'm an owner of Big Story Bookstore on Greenwood and Third. Um, so that would be a conflict. And I'm also on the court area advisory board and the Ben Central District Business Association board. Awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Cindy King and I'm currently chair of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. And I have no potential or perceived conflict of interest. And sorry, I'm a little bit late. I got halfway here and forgot my phone. So I had to turn around. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Cindy. I'm Dale Van Valkenburg. I am on the um, Urban Renewal Advisory Board. Core, core area. Core area advisory board. I've been on too many advisory boards over the years. Um, I also, my employer is Brooks Resources. Uh, we own property at 181 Franklin, and I guess we could be a development partner that could benefit from this program. So I guess that's a potential conflict of interest. Jeff Baker, uh, I am on the core advisory board as well. Um, my employer is Craft3. Uh, we do lending to early stage companies and some urban renewal. Um, no real conflict. However, some of the stuff that we're discussing today, specifically Astoria, I believe Craft3 helped facilitate some of that program in that region. So, Thanks, Jeff. And then Sharon, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Sharon Smith. Um, I'm uh, on the advisory board, courier advisory board as an ex officio member representing the school district, and I'm employed by Emma Schools and no conflicts. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you all know where we're going. Go back to my other. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Bear bear with me here for a second. It starts at the beginning. Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to cruise back to the beginning of this. Um so again our meeting agenda today we we already covered intros and conflict of interest. Um, I'm going to give a presentation. Um, Cindy, I think you're kind of the only one that hasn't really heard the beginning of the presentation, but just to kind of bring everybody back up to speed of like, why are, why are we here today? Kind of what's the task in front of us? Um, and then go into some specific examples, local examples of development projects, some of the barriers that they're facing, and how some of these development partnership programs kind of give a sense of scale of how some of these development partnership programs from other communities would um, how they would impact a local project here. So kind of take the program parameters from another city, put them onto development projects here and kind of show you what that looks like. 
And then we'll open it up to public comment. We don't have anybody, at least here in the audience in, in person today, but I do think that there's at least one person in attendance online. Um, so we will have a period for public comment um, and then just open it up to discussion. I did put some discussion questions in the agenda to kind of brainstorm some discussion, but really kind of just give me, I already have kind of a general sense of where we're going with the development partnership program, but I really want to hone in on what you all think are the key development barriers and things that we really want to incentivize. So that way the next meeting, we can really kind of dive into recommended program parameters um, and recommendations and really work towards developing a draft partnership program. Um, but today's a little bit more just high level discussion. Any questions on that first? Okay, so, and then kind of bringing it back further to the why. Uh, hide. Sherry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like kind of hide you a little bit just so we can see the full, full screen, but I think we'll still be able to see just you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so again, kind of more for background for other advisory, you know, other advisory board members, we did invite both BDAB members and AHAC members to attend this conversation and BDAB is still working to identify some folks to attend. We have two more subcommittee meetings of, of this subcommittee. So hopefully we'll get some more BDAB representation at that. But, um, the core area advisory board is looking at identifying sort of a five-year budget for how we're going to spend core area investments over the next um, between the 2023 to 2028 period. And we think we have about 10 million, maybe 10 and a half million available to start investing into the core area. Um, we've kind of have earmarked 6 million of that to go towards Midtown Crossing improvements, which are still um, being decided on how those get spent. And we're going to be um, getting an update from council next week on kind of how they would like to see those funds allocated. But there's another about four to four and a half million available for other needs. And so a development partnership program would be something that um, would be eligible for some of those other funds. And then this is obviously going to try to, we're trying to kind of set up a program that is scalable for the future of the district as well. Um, so, you know, in the next five year cycle of the core area funds, we're expecting another 12 to 15 million available to fund and investments and projects in this area. So we, we do expect that the, a development partnership program will always be an ongoing program as part of the core area. And so we're really kind of setting what the parameters of that program looks like now, um, hopefully a good base, and then we can always revise it again in the future, but hopefully uh, set it up for success to begin with. So this is kind of the trajectory we're on. Um, this subcommittee will meet three times for the first time today. We do have a full CAB meeting October 20th, so next Thursday. And then this subcommittee will convene again October 31st. Maybe if you feel like wearing a fun outfit for Halloween, <laughs> that is always encouraged. Um, and then we'll reconvene again on November 14th with this subcommittee. And the goal is to kind of have this, uh, this subcommittee feel comfortable, comfortable enough to kind of um, give direction on a draft development partnership program that can be brought back to CAB. Um, depending on kind of staff capacity, it, there's a, there's a possibility that we can get that partnership program buttoned up enough to kind of bring to council and borough for consideration at their December meeting when they are thinking about your full CIP, but we might just need to kind of bring it to them for refinement and direction and then bring it to them early next year. So we'll, we'll kind of see where it lands, um, as far as time to get it, it, it takes a lot to get these things reviewed through finance and legal staff in particular, make sure that we're set up for success. So um, TBD on when exactly it gets done, but the goal is to kind of have something established by early next year. So um, there, I sent out a memo as part of the agenda. This was already presented to the core area advisory board at their last meeting, but I'll kind of just do a quick recap, um, you know, development partnership program, think about a public private partnership. So with urban renewal and TIF dollars, we have a lot more flexibility in the things that we can invest in than we do with some other public funding sources that we have. And so we are actually able to contribute to private development projects to help close a funding gap through various mechanisms. This could be done through, um, grants or loans. Um, either one-time assistance grants or kind of like a rebate or annual reimbursement. And those annual reimbursements are really um, considered sort of a best practice to limit impacts to a TIF district. So um, the more that we can kind of break up 
a contribution to a project over time, the easier the easier it is for us to finance that um, contribution and other project priorities that we have of the TIF district, particularly in the early years of the district. Um, you can also set up um, smaller grant programs. So those might be something that you, that you would use to support existing businesses in the district or you know new startup businesses in the district. So through business assistance, grants, loans, or even pre-development assistance. So a lot of cities um, will offer up to 15 hours of architectural or design services that can be billed to the Urban Renewal Agency and reimbursed um, just so that they can start exploring the feasibility of a project or an improvement to their site. Um, and then land acquisition and or disposition is also um, a mechanism that urban renewal agencies can, can utilize. So the, the image on the right is an example of a project in Redmond, Oregon, where um, urban renewal, they used two different urban renewal programs that they set up to support this project. One was an SDC buy-down program for the housing component of the project. And they also set up a housing loan fund. Um, and this project is looking at doing a renovation of a downtown building to um, bring like a kitchenware food store to the ground floor. And then the second phase of the project will be to develop eight apartment units on the second floor. And this has been a vacant building for quite a, for quite a while. Um, so we looked at, I don't know how many are on the list, maybe eight or nine, seven to nine programs across the state in the Northwest. Um, to look at kind of ideas of how we could structure a development partnership program. And that is really kind of what led to the development of this memo. So this just kind of um, looked at all these development assistance programs from other communities and identified kind of what are common themes that we were seeing among those different programs, um, but want to make sure that any program that we develop here locally is um, serving the unique needs that are being experienced in the core area. So these are meant to be kind of idea generators, but not necessarily what exactly we need to adopt for our development partnership program. Um, but what we learned from looking at these is that typically those one-time assistance grants are capped around 200 to 300,000. Um, and that may be an appropriate scale for other communities. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be the scale that we look at for our development partnership program, but something really important to keep in mind is that anytime a project receives more than $750,000 of assistance from a public entity, they do trigger prevailing wage requirements. Um, so that's just something to be really mindful of. Um, when a project had a very significant public benefit, maybe it was being... Um, led by a nonprofit agency or kind of a local community partner. Sometimes that one-time assistance was exceeded, but there was at least some type of private to public ratio requirement. And that private could be, you know, nonprofit partners or other partners, but um, some type of ratio of the funds to kind of help preserve the, the TIP district. But that that's kind of on a scale where there's much larger public benefit of the project. For business assistance programs, a lot of times those grant or loan programs were a lot smaller. So I often saw programs capped at a $50,000 grant max versus, you know, the 200 to 300,000 for maybe a, a major mixed use development. Um, those assistance programs range somewhere between 4,000 to $10,000 per project with at least a 25 to 50% match requirement. Um, and then a, a lot of programs also offered, you know, to 15 or 20 hours of pre-development cost assistance. A lot of programs also structure um, the program so that they can help support other community goals, such as diversity, equity, inclusion goals, housing goals, and economic other economic development goals within the community. So there's a lot of ways to do it, basically. <laughs> Um, this is a new slide for CAD members. So I did want to kind of just point out, I know that we have talked in the past about some type of developer scorecard um, as an idea. And so one of the programs that we looked at actually has this implemented. So the Capital City Development Commission in Boise has a has um, their development partnership program offers kind of five pathways to partner with the development agency, with the development corporation. And one of those pathways is the general assistance program. And the way that that's structured is they have sort of three tiers. So if a project scores, they have a scoring system. And if a project scores over 140 points, they're considered a level A score. So they get like an A plus on their 
development project. And that leads to higher levels of subsidy. So they would qualify for 80% of the tax increment that they generate on an annual basis to be reimbursed for four years. So I can, I'll can kind of get into like the actual numbers of that in a second, but 80% of the tax increment that they generate on an annual basis gets reimbursed for four years. If they get a level B scorecard, so that, you know, they do a lot of really neat and innovative things in their development, but not kind of that level A, they qualify for a 50% of the tax increment that they generate on an annual basis to be reimbursed for four years. And then if they get a level C scorecard, they don't qualify, right? So pretty easy. <laughs> um, and then there's also, they also offer different pathways for, for developers that are interested in doing more um, middle income or mixed income or affordable housing projects. So for those they offer, um, like if they're doing deed restricted affordable housing that qualifies for the low income housing tax credit. So this is kind of a different pathway. They would also get um, whatever their score level was plus an additional 20% of their tax increment reimbursed for up to eight years. So they could potentially qualify for 100% of their tax increment to be reimbursed for eight years. For the mixed income workforce housing, it's again, based on the score level, whether it's 50% or 80% for six years or four years. So just depending on the AMI levels that they're serving. So this just kind of shows an example of a, a pretty robustly designed <laughs> um, program. Could I just ask a quick question? Do we have any success stories from this program? Do we know how it's going? Has it encouraged the affordable housing? I haven't, I haven't reached out to their staff yet. Um, that's a good, one of my questions today is what, what more information do you need? So that's a good follow-up. Yeah. I mean, because speaking with my affordable housing hat, um, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback from folks in that realm that if we're going to give tax benefits, we really should be pushing affordable housing. And I don't want to get into a situation where we're requiring it, but I'd like to see us incentivize it to the point where it's successful, that it, it really is producing the housing that we need without negatively constraining the developers. So mm -hmm. another thing to keep in mind here locally is we also just adopted the multiple unit property tax exemption program that also applies. So developers are already able to, um, in, in this area that we're talking about, if, if they meet certain requirements, even just 10% affordable or 30% at 120 with other public benefits, they can qualify for you know, all of their residential improvements to be tax abated for 10 years. So that's another thing that's in play mm -hmm. already as an incentive. Thank you. Um, so that as, are there questions on just kind of the overview or what we learned from other cities before I move into specific development examples? Allison, the only thing I'd add to Kathy's um, would just be not only like, how's it going, but like who is administrating the program only because like grants super easy to be done by a city, like this lot more involved from different departments, right? Like just trying to figure out like what's the overhead on some of these projects, mm -hmm. um, I think would be beneficial too. Yeah. And staffing needs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm looking, you know, a grant program that's up to 50,000. All right. That can be handled this type of stuff, a lot more involved, right? Yeah, and just kind of another caveat too, for, for your perspective, the the more detailed you wanna get into a scorecard, the more time that's gonna take on a staff perspective. And so if you want to get kind of a program up and running sooner, we should probably think about simpler terms for now and then maybe revisiting a scorecard later. So there's different ways to kind of phase the implementation of this too, but just keep in mind that certain things, certain elements like this can also increase staff needs both for setting up the program and monitoring it over time. But the, I do have a copy of the scorecard that they use, which it does really, um, it's based on kind of different things that they're really trying to incentivize in Boise, right? So whether the developer is activating dormant or disinvested sites. And so that's really like, is it a reuse of an existing building? Are they converting surface parking? replacing vacant land or a dormant building. Um, if they're reusing um, targeted sites, so if they're doing a historic register building, 
uh, automotive or trucking historic use or a former dry cleaning site. So it just kind of gets into like different, um, it's, it's neat, right? It's cool to kind of think about it from that perspective, but it is definitely a lot more detailed. Yeah. The former dry cleaning sites are the most polluted, it's very, very difficult, often in registered, federal registered toxic sites. I mean, they're really horrible. So <laughs> I don't know if we have any in our, in our center. Yeah. Um, That's a tough one. Anyway. There was Kathy's cleaners. I know that. Um, it was at least like a clean laundry site, but I'm sure it wasn't about it. Anyway, so but I'm sure that there's there's more than you'd think. Um, you know, the other issue is usually proximity to railroads. That's usually an environmental issue as well yes, as We have a lot system. of like CNG or petroleum based businesses, particularly on that first street corridor between the railroad and the first mm -hmm. street. I mean, it's almost easier to deal with petroleum than it is to do with the chemicals that are involved in uh, dry cleaning. Uh, I've had experience with both. So, so anyway, it just kind of gives you an idea of how different communities structure their programs. Okay, I'm going to dive into a couple of local development examples. So, and I might have to, Sharon, I'm going to have to hide you on this one. <laughs> Let me know if you need, if you uh, want to talk, just speak up. I will. Okay. Okay. So this is an example of the Killian Pacific development, which is a seven story mixed use building that's being proposed on the Spoken Moto site. They're um, planning to construct 312 residential units, 18,000 square feet of commercial space. And this is estimated to be about a $90 million investment into this site. So pretty significant. Um, when I do kind of some, use our calculator to do some estimates for how much TIF this project would generate between when it's expected to receive certificate of occupancy in 2026 through the end of the TIF lifetime when it's supposed to expire in 2051. I estimate that if they... Um, so if they were not to receive the MUPTI tax exemption, the 10-year tax exemption, um, that is a program that's available today, they would generate $18.6 million in TIF over that, you know, 24, 25-ish period. Um, with the initial year, we would be collecting about 690,000 annually to the TIF funds. With the MUPTI program, if they are to take advantage of that tax exemption, they'll generate about 12.4 million in TIF total with the first year only collecting 150,000 um, on, an, on an annual basis. That would you know, gen an increase over time. And then after that 10th year, after the tax exemption expires, then you'd see a huge jump in their TIF collections. So um, this development in particular has pretty, um, they are going to be contributing a lot to public improvements. They will be responsible for completing the entire industrial way frontage improvements, um, as well as building a three quarter collector street of Sizemore between Arizona, Arizona Avenue and industrial way. Um, but that does not exist today. So they have estimated that the total cost of those improvements is about $1.4 million. So just kind of putting in perspective. So if we were to kind of take that development example and apply the Boise General Assistance Program, assuming that this project is in that scorecard A, they would qualify for, um, again, with the MUPTI program, they would be qualifying for about $120,000 annual reimbursement for about four years. So they would receive a total kind of public subsidy from the TIF district of 480,000. And that does reflect the fact that they have that MUPTI exemption already because you're only giving them that 80% that exemption on what, they're, what we're collecting even with the MUPTI exemption. That makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> so if, we're, if, they're, if they're without the MUPTI, they'd be bringing in 552,000 um, or you'd be abating 552,000, which means they're probably generating, what was it, 690,000 annually. So when you take into effect that they're already getting the MUPTI exemption, you're only giving them 80% of what they're actually drawing in, even with the MUPTI exemption. 
So it's, so this one is what I like about the annual reimbursement is that it scales, even if a developer is receiving the MUFTI exemption. Mm. When you look at the Salem, when you look at Salem's Riverfront Downtown Grant Program, they offer um, 160000 to a project plus 15% of the eligible project costs, but they have a maximum grant cap of 300000 So this project, both with and without the MUFTI, would qualify for a $300,000 grant. And then if you look at like Redmond has an SDC buy-down program that's capped at $5,000 per unit for 30 units. This project's offering much higher than 30 units, so they would qualify for the maximum amount allowed, 150,000. But again, obviously we have different SDC rates, so that, that amount may not be appropriate. But I just wanted to kind of show you what this would look like and how it really varies depending on the, the grant programs that you set up. I, know I have a question. Been... Yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Thanks. Um, do we have any sense of, of how much money the Boise um, ur Urban Renewal or TIF District has? I mean, it seems like the, yeah, the larger it is, the more money they have, they could afford to do this as opposed to ours, which is pretty, pretty minimum, minimal at the, at the beginning of the program. Yeah. Um, I don't know their annual operating budget off the top of my head, but I know that their urban rural district has been in place for longer. So um, it's probably generating more TIF than ours is in the early years. The other things that we would do as part of our program to protect TIF revenues is we wouldn't um, offer these annual reimbursements until the project had received COVO. That way we're guaranteed that that project will be reassessed and that we will collect that TIF. And what is also really nice about those um, annual reimbursements, Sharon, is that if you cap it at a percentage of the TIF that you're collecting, you, you know that you'll always generate more TIF from that project than what right. you're paying them back. Right. Yes, I think that's a very valid question. <laughs> Station in order for development to happen on this site, and I assume it went into. The I can't hear whoever's speaking. Oh, is this on? How do you know if it's on? Can you, can you hear, hear me now? It's very faint. Maybe you can get a little closer to it. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Much better. Thank you. My question was: My understanding was for development to take place on this site, there needs to be a sewer uh, pump lift station and um since they're not contribute it doesn't seem like they're contributing to it or maybe they are as part of their sdcs so um can you hear me now sharon yes i can hear you fine okay um so the sewer pump station is required of the of the core pine site but not killian pacific okay. there's yeah so i was just thinking that in terms that that was another um contribution that the city is making to the site, but it's not applicable here. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have about three more examples, one other big project and then two smaller um, business scale projects. So um, this next project is kind of still in the very preliminary um, phases. They are under contract for the former Les Schwab site on 105 Northeast Franklin, but have not closed on the property. So this is a proposed, um, a developer is proposing to do a mixed use development on the former Les Schwab site. Um, that's estimated to be about a $50 million investment onto that site. Unit counts or kind of total square footage of everything isn't available at this time. Um, but kind of running those general numbers. Again, if this project were to take advantage of the MUPTI program, they would generate about 10 and a half million total of TIF with 112,000 collected on the initial year that they received CFO. Without the MUPTI program, they would generate about 14.2 million total over the TIF period um, with about 442,000 collected in the initial year. This developer, has um, a couple development challenges for this site. So in particular, they're planning to 
um, build a new multifamily building kind of on the Southern portion of the site. Um, and the city does have a main sewer trunk line that runs through the site that they would be re re required to reroute, um, which is a significant development cost estimated between 500 to 700,000. Um, they're also looking at making significant improvements to the first street right of way estimated at around 900,000. So again, significant public improvements being required of, of this development and this site. So again, using Boise's um, general assistance program, I assume this project, I don't know enough of the details of this project to really give it a good scorecard, but just let, you know, for different examples sake, let's say this scores as a level B. So they qualify for a 50% annual reimbursement for four years. Um, you can see what that translates to both with the MUPTI and without the MUPTI program. So if they um, got the MUPTI exemption, they'd be um, qualify, qualifying for about 224,000 total over a four year period for this project. Using Salem's Riverfront Downtown Grant Program, they would qualify for the full $300,000 grant. And there's lots of different ways to, to scale it, right? Based on our own unique conditions, but just wanted to kind of take like, here's how one city does it and put it on an example project. Um, okay, so then this, the next two are more business scale um, projects. So um, we have done some equity outreach work to a couple Latino owned businesses in the district and um, have, have talked to the owners of Kalima Market about some of the improvement desires that they would, that they would potentially apply for if they were available for their site. And they've talked about um, potentially doing an art mural, an art mural on the side of their building, as well as improvements to the front entryway that they have some flooding issues today. Um, so I did reach out to Alyssa, Alisa from Big Story to kind of just get a sense of what a mural cost. Um, and she was really, this is actually, she, you're the co-tenant of the same building. So it's hopefully pretty good cost estimate of what the mural would cost, um, which is about 8,700. And that includes design, installation, the paint, city permits, and prepping the wall for the mural. You said eight and that says 18. Eight, 18, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then we don't know the cost of improvements to the front entryway. Those are still unknown. Um, the owner hasn't had you know, time or funds to look into what those costs would be. So if we were to apply um, Redmond's kind of stacking two of Redmond's programs. So they offer the free design assistance program that would reimburse up to 15 hours of architectural engineering or other design work to just investigate the feasibility of a project. Um, this business owner, right, could apply for that, those funds to look at what it would take to improve the entryway of their site. Um, and then they could apply for up to $5,000 of funding for exterior rehabilitation um, projects. Again, just kind of shows an example of what could be done in the scale of a local a business example. Um, open space event studios. We've all kind of, I think, seen this case study and we've seen it on our walking tour, but they completed renovations to the former Second Street Theater. Um, they would like to expand operations to the former auto mechanic shop adjacent to the studio. Um, but the proposed improvements trigger a change of use and therefore sidewalk improvements on a corner lot. Um, these cost estimates are about a year old, so they might have gone up by six to seven percent given inflation. Um, but they estimated those sidewalk costs were about fifty thousand five hundred about a year ago for just construction only. So just again, kind of getting a sense of what the scale of some of these improvements um, and costs are. Any questions on, on any of these? I'm sorry, I always have so many questions, but um, in this case, we were talking about some other options about sidewalks in the sense that maybe there was an in-lieu fee that could be paid towards the general fund to do sidewalk improvements when it was appropriate and fully designed. Um, it, is that something, how would that, fit into something like this? I'm just curious. Yeah. So I think there's, I need to put probably a lot more thought into it, but kind of general 
when I've put some thought into it, I think what, what it will ultimately take is a code change to develop a sidewalk in lieu of, um, pathway for developments in this area. And then you could be collecting some of those in lieu of fees and combine them with an urban renewal kind of annual program that is sort of a sidewalk program, right? And then on an annual basis, we could determine or biannual basis, we could determine what are the priority sidewalk locations that we want to use that sidewalk in lieu of fee program and seed funding from the urban renewal district of where we want to prioritize sidewalk improvements. I would just urge us to consider that strongly um, to make sense in this area um, and to help with these kinds of situations. Um, however, we can make that work. I, I encourage you to give it more thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ideas or thoughts on this? I think one thought, I'm not sure if it fits exactly here, but it's sort of like it goes to scale. So, you know, you've shared some, like, I would say bigger projects and then sort of maybe on the smaller end of the spectrum. And so I think we all know, or some of us know that in the BCD, this is a super parcelized place with lots of small lots and lots of different owners. And so the challenges that that brings. And so when I think about who, who can we serve with this program, like I really go to that kind of like small scale developer that maybe isn't bringing hundreds of units on, but is bringing on eight here and 10 here, right? That are really gonna be a core part of this fabric. Um, and so I don't see that in the examples and I know it's impossible to provide, you know, they're all gonna be different, but I do feel like with this program, that is something I have a, a particular interest in really trying to unlock because I think for like the core pine site, you know, like we've talked about, that's that's a brownfield, but it's kind of got a very different runway to develop, right, for some of those bigger projects. And I do think for the BCD, if we do want to see the kind of development we want to see, we really need to kind of be thinking about and getting at how can we provide something that's really going to be helpful for those smaller scale developers and those really small, like kind of parcelized lots. You know, I, I agree with you. At the same time, I'm concerned that we don't um, overemphasize that to then negatively um, generate even more funds because I think some of the larger projects are the ones that are going to trigger a lot of tax coming into the district. So finding that sweet spot mm -hmm. where we're definitely doing what you're saying, but not to the negatively impact the larger projects that'll really help jumpstart and get our funds going so that we have even more funds to feed into that. So just trying to find that balance, I think is going to be interesting. A discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a, if I can speak now, um, I agree with uh, both of those perspectives. And it seems like there's two different types of things that we want to incentivize. We want to incentivize affordable or workforce housing. And in some respects, in order for the businesses to thrive, you need to have enough residents there. So I think it's important that we that we consider um, incentivizing residential development. And that seems to be some of the larger projects um, just because of, it costs so much to develop housing. Um, so that combining you know, some housing projects with the smaller, business development projects feels like a good balance. And, you know, we need to get that balance right. But I like the idea of making sure we're incentivizing housing and also helping the smaller businesses. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I think if we want to kind of just open, we can open it up to the public comment and then lead into the discussion, then we can, we're already kind of ready, I think. So um, let's open it up for a public comment. If anyone online um, wants to speak, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll bring you over. I saw that Mary was on and Mary might be like an example of one of those smaller scale developers or infill developers. So, uh, Mary, if you want to talk or give public comment, feel free. Not seeing... Okay, I don't think we have any public commenters. 
There's a something in the queue. Oh, Mary said, not sure my microphone works. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, hi, thank you. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this is great. It's it's good to learn about this program. Um, so I'm Mary Hearn. and I own a property in the Bend Central District. Um, it's located on Northeast Kearney in between second and third. And Allison, you know about the property. We've met, you know, several times to kind of talk about different ideas there. Um, and so the most recent kind of development for me is engaging with an affordable housing developer um, who seems to be really excited about this site and potentially making a project work there. So um, I guess my one question is, would these, the pre-development assistance program, um, or I'm sorry, the developer assistance program work also with, you know, an affordable housing project as well as market rate? Um, it, it's very common for those programs to be stacked. So the city's existing affordable housing program, or we can even, we have the ability to offer direct assistance to our existing affordable housing program with TIF funds as well. So I see this kind of being, this program being a little bit more focused on market rate or mixed income housing projects, whereas we can also offer direct TIF assistance through the existing affordable housing program with this funding source as well, if it's within the TIF boundary. Okay, so, great. Thank essentially, you. Essentially, yes. <laughs> great. Thanks. Okay. They both work here, so. <laughs> um, okay, so let's open it up for discussion then. Um, so we don't have to answer any of these in order by any means, but kind of what are the main barriers that a core area development partnership program should overcome? Or, you know, what are kind of some of the key barriers that we're seeing here locally, or we think we'll see in this district in particular that we really want this program to help um, overcome? And then are there certain types of developments or uses, like I've already heard kind of residential, mixed income, middle income in particular, um, that should be prioritized or incentivized more than others? Uh, how does this vary for properties that are looking at kind of renovations or expansions to existing businesses compared to those that are doing kind of complete site redevelopment, like different scales? So in my experience as an architect for developers, often the offsite costs are a huge impediment. In other words, the sidewalks and the street improvements that are difficult to say it really benefits their specific project, especially when um, there's a requirement for fairly extensive and lengthy offsite improvements um, because of substandard conditions. And we, we definitely have that in the central core. So um, that's why I brought up the issue of the in-lieu fee for sidewalk uh, improvements. I mean, this can also apply to um, sewer, water, any uh, other utilities that are substandard or if there are above above grade lines that need to be buried, those kinds of improvements that you don't really see in the building that gets built, but are a very significant cost, I think is something that our, our group should consider helping with. Can I add a nuanced uh, question to sure. that? Sure. For projects that are more of those big developers that you that you kind of think the the pathway is already paved for them. I think we all kind of have some at the top of our mind. There are significant offsite costs. Mm -hmm. Are you supportive of some type of scale of investment towards some of those developments that are generating a lot of TIF and providing a lot of significant public improvements? Oh yeah, I'm not limiting the scale at all with my comments. I mean, yes, I, I think that we have to balance the need to help the smaller businesses and the smaller parcels with continuing a flow of TIF money into the district by helping the larger projects. So personally, I do see a role, what scale, I don't know. And I think that we need to look at some real world examples of what What's tripping up developers? You know, at what point are they saying, you know what, I just have to wait because I can't make this work right now and find out 
kind of some real world information that it will help us inform our decisions um, because we can't guess. <laughs> and, if, and if we do have people chomping at the bit to develop, but they can't because of X, Y, and Z, we need to know what that X, Y, and Z is. And is it possible that we can help with that? Mm -hmm. Well, have you, this is the first time I've been in this capacity at the meeting. So if I'm repeating something, my apologies, but talking directly with developers, is there any discussion right now as to what they're facing? It's, it seems like on an annual basis, things change for developers. Sometimes it's great. And right now it's really pretty tough. Um, and a lot of them are pulling back just because of the cost and the unknowns for the economy. Are you having these ongoing discussions to find out what is tripping them up? right now? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the the two examples that I gave, it's it's all public improvements in the right-of-way that um, okay. are significant. So, or, you know, there's other, there's plenty of other examples, but in particular, like the Les Schwab site, it's relocating a city sewer trunk line and high levels of cost of public improvements that they're triggering as frontage improvements, right? So that's, um, and it is also a lot easier from the urban renewal agency perspective to focus funds towards improvements in the public right of way because those are assets that the city then owns. So it's it just makes the bonding um, for financing those projects a little bit easier, cleaner, a little cleaner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I can you know echo. I mean, we have a, a project that's uh, kind of just sitting there right now and. A big part of it is is construction costs, you know, which is not really related to anything we're talking about here. But um, I mean, for us, um, you know, these kind of incentives are yeah, they're great and they can work into the pro forma, but they they shouldn't really be the tipping point necessarily to whether or not to build a project. I mean, if you're that close, it's kind of a little scary to go forward with fifty million dollars or ninety million dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for us, uh, the, the big thing that we were most interested in and still are is, is getting some sort of assurance of, of infrastructure improvements to corridors. You know, on Franklin, it's, um, you know, we didn't really want to put 150 residences um, on that street in its current condition. And, you know, our project couldn't afford to build the whole corridor. We'd build our frontage and it would be pretty, but we we're really looking for some commitments as to timing so that when we would open up our building, the corridor would be ready to go too. So, and I, I have misgivings about um, anything we're doing here that is, is giving the TIF funds back and not letting them go into the district to make improvements. Um, I really would rather see the money go towards if we can, figure out our incentive programs into things that uh, are gonna lead to more and more people investing because they see things happening. And, oh, this street looks good. Okay, now we don't have to build our sidewalk or it, it just changes the, uh, the perception of the place, which is not really lovely now. Uh, it can use a lot of help. And so I'd like to see that money go into helping the district uh, float all the boats. So when you say, okay, we don't have to build the sidewalk, so now it looks good. Are you saying that the, the first developer did the sidewalk improvements and now down the line, they're not responsible to pay toward that? Uh, well, it would certainly be a bit of an incentive if you're the next one in and the sidewalk's already built. I mean, those aren't really, I mean, improving your frontage, I think, is generally just sort of anticipated as a cost that you're going to do. But having a little bit of frontage and especially... Yeah, larger sites, it's a, it scales a little better, but when you get all these little sites, they're going to build, okay, a really nice little section of street that's 100 feet long. Mm -hmm. um, and then 300 feet down, somebody else does it. It's like, we really need to do those corridors. Uh, it's much more cost effective. And so it's that's kind of, it, it gets into the example of the open space event studios where it's kind of a sidewalk um, uh, abatement program where you come in and build it later versus a full corridor improvement. And at some point it kind of crosses over into a, a bigger thing of improving a whole, you know, second street and uh, especially those three streets like second Franklin and, and Greenwood, I think are kind of key streets that would be, and then also highly visible to uh, casual uh, citizens uh, driving through the district because those are the ones most people drive on mm -hmm. and they'll see, you know, stuff happening. Um, 
as opposed to like, yeah, this area is just a place to get through. As opposed to someplace somebody would want to stop and spend some time. Just to just kind of a thought on that, I, I think at least in this early year, we will need to cap the partnership program at how much TIF you want to direct towards it, right? So um, that's kind of where that CIP plays in of we're going to set direction for these corridor improvements or these streetscape improvements to move forward. And this development par partnership program will be funded to, to this amount unless it's proven, right, that we will generate more TIF than originally anticipated through this development um, or through multiple developments that are in the pipeline. Um, but we're being conservative with our estimates of not accounting for developments that haven't received certificate of occupancy because we don't want to build that in to what we're assuming we can leverage when there's no guarantee that that project will hit that milestone, if that makes sense. Um, does that help address at least some of your concern there? Or um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, a principle of, of how do you use the funds? I mean, do you use them to just go directly into a project, which is, you know, having the project there is the key. I mean, if nobody builds anything, you know, we all lose uh, in the stiff game. So if that's what it takes to get a project off the ground, that's great. I would just prefer to see uh, that allocation of TIF funds be visible to everybody mm -hmm. in, in public improvements. Yeah, and, and that's why I, I brought it up in the first place because my, my experience is that that's really critical. And it is something that's pretty clean for us to say that's our property now, you know, and I don't know. I, I think that we need to kind of consider the scale of things. Like for instance, if you're doing um, a $9 million project and we're saying, oh, we have 250,000 for you, that's not really making much of a difference. But if we're saying we're improving that whole street corridor so that it's now an inviting environment and more things will happen, that's a, you know, a better use, I think, of our funds. I, I do know that sometimes, um, and I don't know if that happens here or not, but uh, in some development, if if one developer is stuck doing a fairly significant amount of like sidewalk improvement, that all of the contiguous properties that also are on that have to chip in. If they go to develop, they have to reimburse basically for what happened in front of their properties so that they're not just getting a win um, for it. I don't know what other things could happen that could help with the financing of that, but I tend to agree that the frontage improvements and, and for us to really consider, we, we've had this discussion before about the different you know, corridors, but I, I really do think that's something that we should focus on. But I don't mean to say that we shouldn't also create a program where we're helping individual smaller parcels if they if they need something. I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, but I think we also really need to spur as much development happen as soon as possible so that we ultimately have more tax dollars to give to everybody to lift all the boats. So yeah, and I think just for folks who oh go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say for CAB, I feel like this has been like the a crux question for us, right? Of like you know, hey, there's six mil that's already earmarked for midtown crossing related things, right? That leaves us with around four and a half. How do, right? And this is the question Ali poses to us often, right? Like how do, how do we wanna allocate the rest of that? Is it doubling down on this infrastructure, right? That says, hey, like these are the things that truly lift all boats that are what's needed to help spur the kind of development we wanna see, whether it's at the Corpine site or in the BCD, and so it's kind of like the skate, like I getting it the right size, like out the gate of like, what are the things that we really think are going to move the needle? Because I hear what Dale's saying of like, you know, if you're a developer and you're looking at these funds, right, and it actually isn't a tipping point for you, it's just a nice to have, not a need to have. Um, like that, I think that should factor into kind of like where we're putting the funds, right? And like where we think we're really getting maximum impact. And I, I love this analogy and, and Dale and I think other builders that I've been meeting with in the BCD have used is sort of like this bait base hit versus home run thinking, which is like, it's great to swing for the fences and we do need some of these big catalyst things to go, right? Like, because they are going to be such big generators for the TIF. But let's say, let's take that $90 million investment in one site. If you're able to catalyze 10 sites in the BCD, right? They're going to be bringing value that's like 90 million plus maybe. And so it's like, I, I 
I agree with Kathy, there's a balance to be struck here, but I think like the base hit thing, particularly for the BCD is, is something that I think we really need to be thinking about because we're gonna put so many so much money towards infrastructure. And then it's kind of like, how do you really get that barrier of the small lot rolling, right? And we've we talked a little bit about like the cost that builders have, right? If you're doing a big project, that's a little easier to get things to pencil maybe than if you're just doing a one-off project that's a very small parcel, right? And so, and I think this is sparked by a lot of conversations I've been having with developers in the BCD, just so folks know, Landwatch is looking at pulling together like a BCD small builder round table that really actually like cues in a lot of the questions that like, Al, you know, that Ali's posed to us today. Um, so happy to, you know, include folks or share back what we hear, of course, but, you know, really trying to understand like what that looks like for folks so that it is truly structured because it's not that it's at the end of the day, it's not all that much money. Right. So I think it's like, for me, it's just, I'm still not clear about like how we just really like maximize the parts of the puzzle that like, we just haven't quite accounted for yet. And so um, that's kind of where my head's at when I'm kind of struggling with a little working through. Do, do you think your your group is looking to um, the the program of helping offset some costs for architecture and engineering, it, also kind of walking plans through the process, mm -hmm. is something I think that could really help the smaller parcel owners. Yeah. And if you could maybe even hire even part time somebody to help facilitate that, uh, or or if you created a program that, I guess what I'm trying to say is leverage, leverage the knowledge mm -hmm. and spread it around all these people. So not everybody has to reinvent the wheel every single time they want to try to develop their parcel, mm -hmm. but that there's a body of knowledge or there's a group of people already available to help with that would be great. I agree. I think when we talk about putting a lot of emphasis into big developers, then my vision of the BCD turns into the way it is right now with a couple of really cool large developments with people living there and then again driving or <laughs> going somewhere else and that isn't what I think we're all trying to picture which is those there those large developments lots of people in those um, residential areas and then those smaller units, um, commercial areas, um, restaurants, art galleries, retail, like mixed use, obviously, or I don't want to say only mixed use buildings, but mixed use throughout the BCD. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do agree that being careful of, of incentivizing only big developers um, and putting um, making sure that we're allowing people to, you know, um, people being business owners, property owners, um, to visualize something for their space that is exciting and different and, and in the direction where the BCD is going without there being these like empty lots or, you know, um, building owners that just don't see the benefit of putting money into their um, their building when the area is just kind of vacant, except for these large developments. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is as far as like where we put emphasis over the next five years, um, 10 years. Um, so just want to be sure that it isn't, that we're not only thinking about how can we, and I know that's the point of the tip, but <laughs> uh, mixing the emphasis and understanding that we need to be filtering money into the TIF, but also um, maybe like organically how that could happen as opposed to just that direct, let's put money there to then hopefully make it happen for the rest of the area. Um, so that also leads to a question about the percentage of, so the reimbursement idea as opposed to the grant. Mm -hmm. um, so is that more looking at then long-term TIF funding so that, because four to eight years, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money that wouldn't be going into the TIF. And so, 
you know, I think maybe that's why we'll only have the 10 million for five years, which is only, but <laughs> the 10 million for the five years because you're expecting or we're going to be considering this type of reimbursement of this tax. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. Um, so, okay. Can I ask a follow-up question to your first comment? And then I'll try to break down how the financing works a little bit, like from a timing perspective, a little bit more. So what I'm kind of hearing from the group is you, you'd like, you, you don't necessarily want to not help anybody, right? You want to help raise all boats, both big developers, middle, middle scale and small scale, but that you might be um, more open to like a larger proportional support for like those middle and smaller projects than the larger projects, potentially. That I might be kind of hearing that. Kind of what to to Dale's point of like, is this six hundred thousand going to make that big of a deal? Is it going to hold up it, them not having this six hundred thousand dollar grant or whatever it is the total? Is that going to hold up their development of their nine million dollar? Like, I don't know. I just have more of interest of helping the smaller ones because of that. Like they've already said they're going to put millions of dollars. <laughs> so I want to help them so that they could then incentivize the, the, the whole bucket. But um, preferably I would put it towards people who could be, you know, living here and they own property already, or, you know, they're, it, it's actually feeding more into our, the community. That's just my, you know, mm -hmm. uneducated as far as like who owns what properties and, you know, who's funding all this. That's just. Yeah. I'll let Dale go back. Another follow-up question that I had to some of your comments was just let's, what are some of those targeted uses like the art space or that it might be helpful to kind of come back to identify what some of those are, or at least give direction for me to bring back like a list of maybe some of those targeted uses. Um, so kind of, just wanted to bring that up and then Dale, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> you know, around town, there's, there's a lot of buildings being built now that are the type of buildings we're talking about. Um, you know, just driving to my dentist this morning, I could see two big cranes, um, you know, looking west. It's like, when do you ever see that in Ben? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we're really after in, in the central district, the core area in particular over here is, is the pioneer, you know, somebody to, be willing to invest the money and take the chance at it. And um, I think the types of incentives that we're talking about are gonna move the needle more for the, the smaller investor owner. Um, I think those types of, it's just my gut, my opinion, but I think those smaller projects like that where somebody's invested in it and emotionally wants to see succeed, are more likely to maybe be that pioneer on a smaller scale. And I think the kind of things we're talking about here are probably really helpful for those smaller scale projects to get somebody going at it. Once somebody builds one of these projects in the core and it's successful, I think we'll all be really surprised how quickly they start happening. Um, once the money, I mean, because it's, it's strictly a business investment. Right? How much does it cost to build? How much rent can I get? How much... Is it going to cost to do this? And once that works for somebody and other people can, can model after that, you're going to start seeing them go up. And that's what we're after here is somebody to like take that chance and, you know, walk out there on the ice and, and show that it can work. And then, then the TIF will be in great shape. But right now, nobody's quite willing. Everybody's faking each other out to, to move ahead. Maybe it'll be Kurt. Maybe it'll be great. Incentivize that first person. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be really careful yeah, with, with your incentives because it's like you don't want to have the you know when projects are already working you don't want to be giving away your tiff you just you want to be able to scale it back in quickly when it's not really yeah when it's snowballing anyway and the projects are going to get built one way or the other or ask for more in exchange for the assistance right we we want more of the units to fulfill this very immediate income need or. Yeah, the bar should be pretty low right now to get somebody to to take the step. And then once once it's going, then you can start asking for more and giving less to get it. Um, on your 
thought about like art galleries and stuff. What I liked, I started this, the Astoria development. They had like a, just a quick, I think it's two sentences, maybe one. And that's what I keep talking about is like that, the vision of the core area. And they just list out what these grants go towards. They're very just like exterior visibility. That's important to them. Um, I, I don't know if it's a mission statement of the core area or like just something. I think that is a good starting place for us to go, okay, does this fit in with our goals or I don't know what it would be called, but mm -hmm. a statement of funding mm -hmm. so that it, it's kind of a guideline, more general and broad, but also something of does it fit in to what we're expecting from the area? So the Juniper Ridge Development Partnership Program for our existing urban renewal district, the Juniper Ridge Urban Renewal Plan has you know, goals or objectives, and the Development Partnership Program as part of the application requirement requires that the projects are consistent with those goals and objectives. So in the core area urban renewal plan, we have the core area guiding principles so that we could easily reference those, or we could develop some type of mission statement for the development partnership program itself. So I think there's two different ways to kind of at the front of the application say, this is the purpose of this program. These are, you know, does, how does your project align with this purpose or these goals? Yeah, I think like your comment to me in my mind, it's like what activates the street? You know, is it art galleries? Is it restaurants? There has to be a there there for all these new residents to want to go to and contribute to. So, you know, even if it's a, a facade improvement that activates the street, you know, maybe there's tables and chairs out front on the sidewalk, you know, or, uh, you know, anything that will really draw not just peop new people who live there, but the rest of the city to come to that area and start activating it. And, you know, to me, that's, that's what I would love to see us, you know, help. But also to Dale's point, it seems like the program is going to have to change over time based on the lived reality of what's going on. But you, you have a good point in that you ask for more for the funds. But I, I think you're right, Dale. It's like once your project happens, for instance, I think we're going to see a lot. But for your project to happen, you need a street improvement corridor happening. So I feel like some of our it, some of the funds are are for that already in terms of the crossings. But then the north south um, streets also need to be activated. So I feel like we can't create a perfect program right now. We're, we're, we're going to have to kind of feel our way to a degree. You know, we want to encourage middle market housing, for instance, that, you know, is important. But we also want to encourage the activization, the non-residential types of, of improvements. And so I don't know how flexible we can be, but I feel like there needs to be some flexibility in what we're doing so that it can adjust over time to the, the lived reality of that time of what's really going to make this a success. Uh, so, sorry, that probably says nothing, but <laughs> I just like flexibility, I guess. Could it be like, this is our two, first two years, 2023 to 2024 plan and get in while it's hot before <laughs> it changes. Like, can you, um, do we need to map out People need to be able to plan yeah. a certain amount in, into the future because it, it takes time to design something and get it financed and then get it under construction. You know, it, if we're a reimbursement at that close. Of yeah, I mean, you ideally, um, I wouldn't recommend kind of setting program parameters you know, that are that like expire on a date earlier than five years from now, just because if somebody is looking at acquiring a property now and going through the planning and permitting process, like it, it, there's a time scale built into that, that it's just nice to have a little bit more security, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's still going to be there by the time you get to that stage. Kind of like the, um, the black Friday sale concept, you know, hundred dollar TVs for the first, you know, two people in the store, but that's Kind of what we're after here. That's what I'm. Thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that our goal is to. Yeah. What I what I would recommend, right? Especially, I think it's a little bit easier for the business assistance programs because the the larger developers, they they come in on 
a different, like you can't necessarily say like, this is the timeline you need to follow. Cause they're, they're coordinating a massive construction project that's on its own kind of timeline. But with, especially those business assistance programs, I definitely think that there's a way to say like, we have, you know, let's fund this program annually with a hundred thousand or 150,000. And we have, we have 15, $5,000 grants that we can offer and do a call for proposals. Like that's definitely an option. Um, or you can still do it on like a, a rolling application basis. And it's, it's capped at a certain amount of, unless we come to you and you get another application and you're like, we really want to figure out how to fund this one. But a, a $5,000 grant is, is not going to be the make it or break it of the TIF funds by any means. So, um, there's different ways to kind of set those up, but I would recommend that you kind of annually fund a program, especially for the business assistance. And then those um, larger development projects, especially if they're scaled to how much revenue they're paying into the TIF, the TIF will go up as well with the development of that project. So they likely wouldn't be getting a full reimbursement until the TIF agency was for sure collecting those funds. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's important to, to fund not just the small existing businesses with these grants, because what we are really looking for is that pioneer. And we need to make sure that we have um, enough incentive in place for that, you know, the first big, not big, the first medium to large um, redevelopment um, entity with uh, hopefully a um, um, you know, mixed use building where we get residential and we get some businesses. And I think what we don't know is what are the barriers for development of that larger project? Um, you know, highlighted, Dale highlighted the corridor needs to be improved. Um, are there sewer and power issues that, that need to be solved? So we need to determine what are the barriers to that larger development coming in, because the reality is until we get enough residential development, um, we're not going to activate the business development. And it's a chicken and egg thing. You have to have enough people downtown in the core area living there to really activate the whole space. So I think doing um, smaller development business assistance is really key to, to keep the existing businesses going. but we need to figure out how to get that first fish in, the big fish. And I had a few more comments, but before I jump in, I just want to make sure like Jeff and Cindy, if you, you know, there's, you had anything to say. I know we're coming up on the, on noon. So before I throw another thought log on the fire, I thought I'd check in and see if there were other comments. I, I would just say, I'm in agreement with a lot of the concepts. Mm -hmm. It's, like chicken or the egg. The only thing, I mean, I have perspective on like the business assistance stuff. That's more my wheelhouse. But um, in the interest of having thought logs on the topics now, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I think this was hearkening back to some of the questions that you posed, Ali, at the front end of this conversation. I don't know, you know, exactly if you feel like you're getting the kind of direction you need to help make the next conversation a, you know, an even more informed one, but happy to kind of speak to those. But I think there were some questions up there about like, you know, do we want to have some criteria, right? That kind of helps us understand like, is a particular project that comes in the door meeting enough of this public benefit kind of, you know, and I get what we're saying, right? Don't set it too high, right? But there are like, I think there's an opportunity here to have at least like one hand on the steering wheel about like, the kinds of projects we particularly want to incentivize that like really bring that maximum public benefit. So I do, I am supportive of some kind of scorecard. I don't think it has to be terribly involved or overly complex, particularly in these first years, but I do think that this is a key way for us to really help push those best projects forward. Um, and so I do, I would like to see some, you know, additional work done there to kind of think about like what that could or should look like. Um, I do think scaling it based on other, you know, investments that a project might be partaking in, like makes a ton of sense. Um, so just to give a little more specific direction on some of those questions, um, I just wanted to, to share a bit of that. And I think one other thing to think about here is that something else we've talked about on the cab is that 
there is no master plan for this area, right? And there's a lot of like varying opinions on if that is when that should happen or if we should get a few key things to go first or we should do it now or if that makes it harder or better or whatever. And so I think like because we don't know when or if a master planning effort will happen, typically that gives some shape or form, right, to like how something develops. I think if we're, we don't have that, I think that makes it even more important to have some kind of criteria embedded in the scorecard um, because that is a way that we, you know, like I said, can have a little bit more influence perhaps on the kinds of projects that really um, start to roll here or that are you know, eligible for some additional incentives. Wasn't there kind of a master plan made about 12 years ago, 12 to 15 years ago for this area? I remember reading, this is my brain, I remember reading very nice books with the outline and this could happen at Franklin, this could happen at Hawthorne, but I don't remember the dates. Um, but it was a, in the last 20 years. There is a central area plan that was completed in the early 2000s yes. and then the Bend Central District multimodal mixed use mixed, M anyway, some MMM acronym, multimodal mixed, mixed, multimodal. Yeah, multimodal mixed use area or something. Area. Yeah. Well, and then there was the Bend Central District Initiative, right, that yeah. Dale was a part of, that Landwatch helped pull together, which was some yeah. sort of like a full-blown, officially adopted like master plan right. that really talked about like, where would uses make sense and what could this look like and who are the property owners and where and kind of went a bit into that, but kind of stopped, I think, short of kind of a full, you know, full adopted um, master plan. Right. For that. So we wouldn't be starting from scratch having all of that history, but that could be, I know that's been discussed. Like, I don't know how that, does it just go away and disappear and then we start over? We, I mean, we have a code that's adopted that has sub-districts and tailored uses in those sub-districts for the Bend Central District. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Some of it has been implemented. I think kind of the next phase of that, right, is as more anchor property owners start to acquire sites or kind of develop their division, their development plans in this area. And as the city um, potentially is successful in securing more land for a city hall, we can do more detailed of like, you know, this block is really the retail street or this block is really um, going to be this like housing focused street, or you will know, we'll have a little bit more understanding of maybe this is like a civic area, or this is a plaza street. Um, like that would kind of be the next phase of a concept plan, I think. And then designating those areas, would that trigger the change of use to where there's going to be additional fees to provide sidewalks or um, environmental studies if there's a an auto shop or, you know, those have a lot of pollutants? I mean, isn't that going to also trigger this change of use to where it's going to add costs to what people may want to do? The so automobile automobile oriented and dependent uses are already a not allowed use. So any existing use is grandfathered in today. But if they wanted to do significant changes to the site, they would already be triggering that change of use today. Okay. Um, That's why Les Schwab can themselves removed right. from the uh, district. Right. <laughs> um, so I guess the question is, when you have a master plan, does it help or hurt? Or is it a combination? Because, you know, people are going to figure out what, what works for them financially at that particular time. Right. And if you've said, no, it can't be that it has to be a museum or something, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it can, it can kill stuff. I mean, at the same time, it could maybe inspire, you know, something, but I don't know. You were going to say something. Yeah, the, the, I went, that's what I was wanted to speak to is the master planning idea. It's like I think we've done enough planning. I mean, this is just my opinion, but I think we've done enough planning for the area, and it's time to start doing. And it's uh, I think the the anchor sites, the bigger sites, are where you're going to see things happen. Um, really, you just have to set the table. What do we want to have happen? What do we incentivize to happen? Um, and uh, you know, like the Miller Lumber site. Man, what a Excite to do some exciting stuff, but there's a viable active business there. So that's not going to become something different right away. Um, and, you know, like Cascade Natural Gas, well, that's where it works for them, you know? So there's, it's, it's really hard to master plan when there's so many property owners. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, it's easier to master plan when you're corporate, you've got right. acres to yeah. deal with. Yeah. You can really get specific about it. Or if you have 245 acres out west of town, like we did, you can master plan them, but it's hard. You've got a, 
an acre of site, well, um, what makes sense financially on it? Right. And um, it's like, oh, well, now we want you to do this on the site. Well, now you've you know, lowered the opportunity that that's going to redevelop. Um, you know, I think all this stuff works together so much. I think the idea of the, you know, like a art galleries and restaurants and the small businesses stuff happening there. I mean, really for the bigger fish projects that we're after, I think the key is for, for us to do those projects or anybody else to do the project is how much rent can you get for the apartment, either subsidized because it's affordable housing or market rate. And right now the assumptions are that you can't get the rent there that you can get elsewhere. And that's why we're seeing projects elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but having those kind of amenities down there are the kind of things that people are willing to pay more for, for rent and improve streets and, you know, bookstores and restaurants and things to do. Um, so, I mean, it's all tied together. I mean, you can't have the residential things happen without the small business development. It's all got to be pushed together at the same time. And the other point I wanted to make, the root point, point I really wanted to make was, I think the criteria are going to get really important as things start rolling and there's more stuff. I think, you know, getting this pioneer is really going to be kind of a more individual negotiation thing because every site is so different. You know, mm -hmm. okay, we got sewer. Okay, we can do this. You can do that. If you do this, we can build that. And to try to incentivize it rather, so having more like general guidelines, we know what we want to see here. Um, I think enabling Allison to, work out the best deal that she can make to get a project to move forward and then taking that to cab and to Burra to approve is is how it has is going to have to work at the start to get uh, get the inertia overcome yeah it's it's kind of the difference between a performance based code and a code that's written like you have to do x y and z you know if you have a a master plan says well this has to be here here and here mm -hmm you're really cutting people off at the knees in terms of what, what's available for them to make work. But if you have a vision, we'd like to see these kinds of things in this area, then it gives somebody more of an opportunity to make that happen and be real based on the specific lodge and their specific lodge. Totally. I mean, the master planning thing, there's like not consensus at all, right? Like people have very, and I think like very informed, great opinions about why it's great and maybe why it's not so great. Um, it's something that for the cab, like we haven't been able to come to consensus on, right? It's not currently something that we're sort of looking at for this first CIP, right? And so, you know, the other kind of side of that is, right, well, let's say that there's a site that's really important to achieving the Hawthorne corridor vision, right? That full build out of connecting all the way from Juniper to Drake and you have one key site because you didn't sort of figure out what could go there or not, right? That it sort of impedes or hinders some other you know, great big investments that could have happened, right? So sort of the other side of the coin. I think I'm still very much exploring and really curious to talk to this cohort of small developers, right? At this round table to say like that exact thing, like master planning for you, helpful, not helpful, right? Like maybe helpful later on, right? Like tease it out a little to like hear the players who are actually gonna be at the front line, like doing this stuff, mm -hmm. like what they really think is gonna help get some of these things rolling. So um, yeah, it's been a very interesting conversation around like that that master planned uh, piece, um, but yeah, it's. I think the vision is really important, mm -hmm. but how exactly it gets put together, we can't control that yeah. to such a degree. Yeah, really only the public improvements. So, yes. um, um, so you know, the city's obviously made a pretty big investment on Franklin. It's like, well, okay, is that gonna be a city hall? You know, what's it gonna be? Cause then, you know, people will start planning around that. Um, you know, the Hawthorne, overcrossing, if that's going to happen, then you're going to see different type of development happen there. Mm -hmm. People know that's happening than what they would do otherwise. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the key stuff to really have sort of planned out and on a schedule so people can kind of know that this is when it's likely to happen. Oh, I'm curious for this group. So that, like one of the questions up here is what other information do you need? to make informed decisions about putting this program together. So our next meeting's what, like two two weeks from? October 31st, so yeah, 20 yeah, I'd days. I'd like to know what success some of these other programs that you've, you've given us have seen or what impediments that they're finding, you know, what's tripping them up, you know, did, was it overly constrained or 
has it been wildly successful or something in between? I mean, mm-hmm. that will really help us, I think, inform some of our decisions. It also sounded like you wanted like some medium scale examples too. That might be helpful. Yeah. And I was going to offer if I can pull this round table together before the 31st, right. It's just going to be like a two hour kind of facilitated casual coffee conversation and just relay whatever information we get from that. I'm happy to provide that to this group as well. So, Just to pair on to what Kathy was saying, I think success of programs is a hard thing to quantify. I think activation Okay. Right. Like how many businesses took advantage? Like, like I, I know the Redmond one in here pretty well. Uh, and like what percentage of business in that area actually took use of that. Right. right? Like I think that like just. To me that's success, but. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, yeah. definition of success. Right. like what is the right. definition, right? Because it's either downstream a hey, tip or this or that, but activation is probably the more right. better barometer on that. For me, so yeah, Re- almost every storefront in Redmond has been touched with their urban renewal, their downtown urban renewal program. So if you um, take a walk, I'd love to schedule like a walking tour with the urban renewal um, manager over there at some point. I just haven't had time, but I know Dale has done that. And um, eye opening to see what they've done. They, they're really active. Yeah, I think kind of a, a follow up question for that too is like, is there specific geographic areas in the core area that you would want to focus some of those facade improvement programs? That might be like a good follow up question for next meeting. Um, yeah, they they have the advantage in Redmond of it being downtown with yes. some cool older historic buildings, and you know the central district was largely an industrial area, so we don't quite have the architecture that they they have in Redmond. Greenwood. Dolly, I have a question. Um, yeah, I was just going to say it might be helpful. I don't know if we can get from um, engineering uh, if they can identify are there some se- some sewer um, fixes that need to happen for a larger um, or medium residential mixed use development to come in. It'd be helpful to know if there's any infrastructure challenges aside from the road corridors um, that that we should be thinking about. Yeah, um, I, I, we have put some thought, <laughs> some thought into that. So the, the yeah. major site that will trigger sewer improvements is the Corpine um, development site. They will be required to build a pump station to serve that site and also um, support some of the old mill is running out of sewer capacity. So yeah. um, that's a big one. And then in the Bend Central District region, there are some undersized water lines specific to some development sites um, or like old galvanized pipes. So that may be something that gets triggered even um, like even the somewhere that's green project. There was like a little bit of a concern that they, if they needed additional water capacity for some improvements that they were looking at, that it might trigger that water line improvement, which for a larger you know, housing development, that may be like a expected cost, but for like a smaller business doing some improvements to like add a bathroom, that's not necessarily an expected cost. Mm-hmm. Um, but sewer is, pr- there's pretty good capacity in here, but we do have a long-term project to, um, to upsize the second street sewer um, line. So, but that's, it's not expected in kind of the next 10 to 12 years of being needed. So um, it's good. more of a longer term need. But the water line, uh, do we have any kind of sc- scale or scope of that? I will try to get a cost estimate for kind of what that would entail. Yeah, and and I think we really should push a little harder on trying to determine whether we could do a in lieu sidewalk program. I think that could be a real barrier for some of these smaller businesses. And, and <clears throat> if we can um, fund it using a combination of the in lieu fee and then some TIF money, we can maybe really improve some of these uh, sidewalk corridors, which I think is really important. Okay. Is there also a desire to potentially look at something of like, let's say a developer, um, it, it doesn't necessarily work on like a collector street like Franklin, but on a local street, if they trigger sidewalk or frontage improvements, if we're able to incentivize them to complete the full block for reimbursement, is that something 
that you all would be open to instead of or in addition to the sidewalk in lieu of fee? So it's kind of hard to describe. Maybe. So if, if a person wants to do their property, but there's no sidewalks anywhere, and you ask them to do sidewalks for their entire block, if they can be reimbursed, is it 100% for those costs? Or what kind of, I mean, it, it could be a, a project killer to do that. I, it just depends on what the reimbursement is. <laughs> if, well, as long as it's under 750,000, let's say they can get reimbursed for anything that wasn't their frontage improvements, but that they do the work. I think most of your smaller business owner or building owners wouldn't be real excited about that idea of doing those improvements. Um, a bigger project, it's like, sure, we can have engineers do cost estimates and, okay, yeah, we could do that and get reimbursed. It'd be fine. I'd love to do that. But the smaller projects, probably not. There's a liability <clears throat> issue, especially on sidewalks. If anybody trips and falls and they can sue and it, it's just, it's a nightmare. <laughs> I think it would be better to do an in lieu fee and have the city take responsibility for that, to be honest. Or if a bigger project thing comes along, they could tap into that, those yeah. accumulated funds to complete the project. But mm -hmm. yeah, you're not somebody who has 50 feet of frontage isn't going to be interested in doing all their neighbors too, I would really, guess. Yeah, you'd really be surprised at how much liability factors into these things. And um, a small person is not going to want to take it on, to be honest. Yeah, but it's the initial construction and with the American access, uh, the ADA requirements on slope and cross slope and making that perfect in lawsuits with ADA, it, it, it just opens up a huge can of worms and it, it's a lot of liability for the engineers. Yeah, but I, I appreciate that. I know what you're saying. I'm very familiar with. <laughs> um, okay, and then just really quick, I know that we're kind of running out of time. Well, we already ran out of time, but the last question. Oh, sorry, just, sorry. One, I, that one example you had up there of a survey of existing businesses, I actually would be interested in that and like what folks are interested in doing, what kind of nature of improvements they'd even consider. Like, I don't know how big a lift that is, but I think it would be really interesting to hear from people who own businesses there now, have something they want to do. And like, if it's like, we just hear that it's murals all over the, right? Like 90% murals that people are like, I think it'd be interesting if it's, you know, reasonable to pull that off. Like, I think that might be an interesting data point just to hear from folks about like what they're actually like interested in doing. And, and to pair off that, what type of capital would they be able to invest in that project? Yeah. Because the examples in here, and this is somewhat dated project stuff, 20 to 50% grant match. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry to a small mom and pop, like it ain't going to happen, especially in this environment. Mm -hmm. And so like, I think looking at a tiered system, if we look at the business, you know, the renovation or renewal, whatever we want to call it, like 25 and under is like zero, right? Like just, don't even have a match or a percentage, but then tier it up, right? Depending on the project. But I think that's a good data point to understand like, hey, we've wanted to do this for 10 years. We literally can't do anything because that type of capital is our operating capital to a small business. So. And also the, how much are you interested in spending? And do you have it now? Because the reimbursement is difficult as well if you have to front the money first. The lower tiered stuff is not. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it being a, a grant at the beginning to, in order to get moving. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. percent agree. What, um, so you were recommending tiering it based on operating? No, tiering it on the max. I mean, like, like just for example, I mean, this isn't the be all end all, but if we're looking at like a grant program, like, you know, for, for like for Redmond, what Redmond did, 10,000 and under, like that is literally project works, $10,000 go. 10 to say 25, maybe 10% owner investment into the total project. Great. 25 to 50, 20%. I, I just throwing out rough numbers. I'm just saying on those smaller improvements. Yeah, we could say like up to $25,000, 10%. That's only, that's only $2,500. But that's operating capital to a small business owner that they are not going to have. And they've been maybe wanting to do a mural for 10 years. 
Right. Right. Let's get it done. That's, we don't need a nickel and dime or maintenance that in my mind. Well, and Jeff, you said you were pretty familiar with the city of Redmond's um, URA, right? And Chuck over there, right? Like, yeah. I'll just I like, it'd be interesting to hear sort of the same question about like Boise's, right? Like, what's the percentage of activation? Like, if it's truly like every single business, and I get differences there with historical buildings and sort of the uber industrial kind of place we're in, but like, it just seems like if you've got somebody that's having that kind of success, it's like making sure we understand and can try and impart into this program, like, we want that same kind of activation here, right? Like we want that same kind of success. So I'm just curious if like, there's something like more to distill there of that specific example, right? Cause there's, you know, lots of research that you've done. Um, but it seems like that's been a pretty, from, from most accounts, right? Pretty successful uh, program they've set up. I think the juxtaposition between Redmond and Madras would be very interesting. The two, like if you go to like Madras downtown versus Redmond downtown. Now Redmond downtown has been active for 10 years, I think on their stuff. Mm -hmm. Madras is a little bit newer, but like just drive through the towns and look at the differences, right? Like what was the barriers here? What was the barriers here? I think that's interesting. Although I would say to your point, Boise is going to be more reflective of Bend than say Redmond. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, well, I, that was a good start. I have <laughs> a lot of notes. Um, we may break up the next two meetings with sort of like more business development focus for one meeting and um, more like housing or residential or mixed use development or what, what larger medium scale developments for the other meeting. Um, and just kind of put some thought into how we organize that. Ben and I can look into doing a survey with the BCD Business Association and getting some information about what types of, you know, what is your business operation today? What types of improvements, you know, are you hoping to make into your business? Um, and then what type of capital do you have available? Um, and get some of that information back. So we might need to put that business development meeting at the November meeting just so that we have time to collect more information. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. I'll, I'll be in person at the next meeting. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you.